This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Uh, the Nasty Girl? Oh. Okay, we're live. We're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, and it's a given Thursday. We have a, a special guest we've been waiting, actually, for months for. <laughs> but now she's here with us. It's uh, Ellen G. Friedman uh, from, the, uh, from the College of New Jersey, uh, where she is a, a, on the English faculty, but she is, uh, more important to this show, the Director of Holocaust and Genocide Studies there. And uh, she's, she's written a number of books, and we want to talk about the book we, we reviewed earlier with her, The Seven, which is called uh, A Family Holocaust Story. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the other books, and we'll talk about one that she's writing right now about <laughs> post, post-war uh, Berlin and what it was like to live there. Right. And all this is based, you know, I'm going to talk about the credibility of authors who wrote, who wrote about and write about the Holocaust, okay. uh, <laughs> and, which was a talk that Ellen gave yesterday right. at University of Manoa, right. uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa. So um, welcome to the show. Welcome well, to thank Hawaii. You. Welcome thank to you our for having crucible me. here. <laughs> thank do. you for having me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, so you came out this time, first time I've met you, Personally, I'm so happy to meet you. Happy to meet you as well. The purpose uh, of, the, of the trip, as organized by Peter Hoffenberg at UH Manoa, uh, who cares about this kind of issue a lot, uh, was to give a couple of talks at UH Manoa. Can you, can you say what those talks have been and are? Okay. Uh, so yesterday I gave a talk at um, the History Forum uh, that was called Authenticity, Truth, and the Future. And... Um, I tried to uh, look very hard at this whole issue around um, Holocaust representations, stories that come out of the Holocaust, uh, and Holocaust scholars' attitudes towards them. And what concerns a lot of Holocaust scholars are issues of authenticity and the right to speak. Which stories are more authentic than others, and who has the right to speak about the Holocaust and claim um, uh, and, and make a claim towards the subject of the Holocaust. Why is this so sensitive? We know there are people who deny the Holocaust, and you know, right. to me, that would be one good reason to make this a sen sensitive issue. We don't want confusion about what happened. We want only authoritative speakers to speak. Right. Um, but I, th I think that's partially uh, what drives this issue. Uh, but for me, Holocaust deniers are like flat earthers. You know, a geologist would not seriously engage with the Flat Earth Society or people who believe that the Earth is flat. Why should Holocaust scholars engage with people who uh, deny that the Holocaust happened? Mm. It's just, on the face of it, absurd. Touch it, yeah. yeah, why? But suppose um, I, I studied it. Um, yes. Know, I, say I'm, uh, no, <laughs> actually, Ellen was not born in the United States. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> Okay. But suppose I'm born in the United States and I studied in school and I, I have a penchant for the subject, you know, a big heart, sympathy, a, a sympathy for it. I care deeply about it because I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and I study it, I care about it, I read everything I can. And now I say, I'm going to write about this. Right. I'm going to be a scholar. I'm going right. to write about this. Do you, do you give me less credence? Well, I would give you 100% um, credence. However, um, other scholars <laughs> might not. Uh, I, I, it's not that you do or you don't have absolute credence. It's a hierarchy. In other words, whose voices are more authentic? Whose voices should we listen to as having the most credibility? And um, the theory is that the closer you are to the black hole of uh, the gas chambers, the more credibility you have. That's fair. Um, and, well, it is and it isn't. Because uh, what happens, how long do you have credibility? In other words, how long uh, uh, does that authenticity, that right to speak, attach to you? 10 years? 20 years? And give me the dichotomy there of the two, the two books that, that compare in terms of veracity. Okay. Well, it's not so much a question of veracity as it is marketability. And the scholar that first brought to the attention um, of other Holocaust scholars that there was a first book 
a Yiddish version. Her name is Naomi Seidman. And uh, she, she could read Yiddish, and so she read the Yiddish version and uh, noticed that it was 67 pages longer than the French version. The French version was edited by Francois Mauriac, who edited it in a way that it would follow a very Christian paradigm of martyrdom. While the Yiddish version was, um, uh, was directed towards Polish Jews because it was, uh, uh, it was part of a series for Polish Jews in Argentina mm -hmm. and um, in their language and also in Wiesel's language. And there he felt free to express his emotions which was rage as, uh, at what had happened to him, his family, um, uh, all the of the family the members he, he lost, and, um, uh, and uh, the final image in that book is of him taking his fist and smashing the mirror rather than him looking at it and seeing a corpse. So uh, that image of the corpse in the French version makes him into a martyr, you know, um, uh, emphasizes his suffering, mm. like the suffering Christ. Mm. The Yiddish version talks about revenge, you know, being enraged. So which this goes to the whole European thing about reacting to the war and the Holocaust. It's a different reaction from the Polish Jewish point of view and the European point of view in general. Right. It's, it's hard to tolerate something for which you might be criticized well, or you might be found guilty. Mm -hmm. Well, my point was that even from the black hole, even from a book uh, that um, uh, was, was responsible, not he, he's written many books, but it was one of the books that helped him get a Nobel Prize for literature. Uh, it's been uh, translated into every language you can imagine. Um, uh, it's so well known. It's just one of uh, you know the most popular books on the Holocaust there uh, there is, and yet this book has questions around the authenticity. So even out of this black hole, there are issues. Mm -hmm. So then you begin. Then I began to look at other testimonies to see what was there, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. uh, -vis this issue of uh, authenticity. So I looked at uh, Claude Lunsman's um, French director, who in 1996 showed this film, his film called Shoah, very famous film, nine and a half hours long, uh, and that was cut from about 350 hours of footage. And, interview uh, footage. Interview footage of perpetrators and uh, survivors. So what you see on the screen are people testifying to their experience. How more authentic can you get? Yes. Yet, Lanzmann himself called his film a fiction of the real. And he did it um, for good reason, because those interviews were scripted. Um, uh, they were manipulated. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, perhaps the most infamous of his, I'll tell you two stories about the film. Uh, first is about Abraham Bamba, who was a barber at Treblinka, cutting women's hair in the gas chamber. And, as um, people were about to be killed. As, a, as, as they were about to be gassed. Women's hair. He was in charge of women, cutting women's hair right before they were uh, going to be gassed. And um, so we see the footage, and here he is in a barber shop. We're imagining that he's still a barber cutting people's hair. Um, and, and he's talking as he's cutting a man's hair, and there are other people in the barber shop. And, and so we think this is very natural. And Lanzmann is off camera interviewing him. Um, and suddenly, uh, he's telling the story of his best friend from his town, who, um, uh, who's also a barber cutting hair. And in walks, I think it's his mother and his sister, although I, I'm not positive Into about that. Chamber. Into the yes, waiting for their hair to be cut, um, and uh, you know it, it's one of those moments. Uh, I, I, suddenly, Bamba, in telling the story, stops talking. You can see the emotion on his face. He stops cutting hair. He's sweating. He's overcome. He's beginning to cry. 
and Lunsman is insisting that he t you have to tell the story. You must. You have to tell the story. This goes on for, I'd say, about four or five minutes until the barber collects himself a little bit and, in a very emotional way, finishes the story. What, uh, so that's what we see on screen. What we learn afterwards, as we study Lundsman's methods, is that he rented that barber shop, uh, that the people in the barber, and the, uh, the barber shop was in Israel, where Bumba had just moved, but the interview was in English. So the extras in the barber shop didn't understand what was going on. So it was a scripted um, a set. I suppose if you look carefully, you would have seen that the people in the barbershop didn't really know what they were talking about. Um, I, I guess so, but you don't, you know, you're, you're looking at Bamba. That's mm. your focus, and yeah. it's the focus of the camera, yeah. uh, which is telling you where to look. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and the film doesn't tell you that this is scripted no, no, or no. staged. No, no, no. Oh, no, not, no, no. Um, Lundsman, for instance, uh, uh, the other story I wanted to tell you is uh, that um, he also wanted to interview perpetrators some of whom agreed uh, to talk to him as long as he didn't uh, film it. So what Lunsman did was he put a, um, they created a kind of bag with a secret camera in it that he brought into the room with the perpetrator and he kept a microphone behind his tie and there would be a van. Which would pick up the sound from the fellow he was talking exactly. to. Exactly. And there was a van outside of the, of the perpetrator's house uh, that would, was manipulating remotely the camera so they could capture the interview. And this is how he, um, uh, how he captured the voices and the stories, which are, some of them, incredible, of perpetrators. And, um, These were the guards, the but, prison guards? The yeah, and, guards. And, uh, and you don't know this as you're watching it. You think that this person has agreed to be interviewed. You really don't know it. Maybe you do. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, afterwards, Lanzmann said, uh, what do I care if I hurt their feelings? These are murderers. I killed them with the, my camera. That was his attitude. And, you know, you can sort of accept that because these were really horrible people. Uh, but but he's also when he us. he's he's uh, yes, uh, but when he he does a, you know he, when he manipulates Bamba, it's a different story. Yeah. Because he's re-traumatizing someone who lived through an incredibly horrible Can you imagine experience. Imagine being in the, in the in the gas chamber. And that my way. larger point is that what seems like documentary may not be. Then you have the Shoah Foundation. Um, which are now creating, which is now creating holograms. The Shoah Foundation is, has, is probably the largest repository of survivor video testimony in the world. Some of that was done by Spielberg? Yes, okay. absolutely. And um, what they're doing with some of that testimony is creating holograms. So three-dimensional images uh, that uh, you know, that uh, may look like uh, a kind of high-tech Madame Tussaud of uh, Holocaust <laughs> testimonies, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so they ask the real survivor these many questions, create the hologram, uh, and, the, uh, and somebody comes in and begins to interact with this hologram, asks them a question that, uh, uh, that the computer I guess um, the computer is uh, programmed so that it responds to certain keywords, and then you get an answer as, as if you're speaking to the survivor. So the attempt is to get to, um, uh, to, get to, the, uh, to that black hole of experience, but it's all, it's all make-believe. It's all as if, you know, because you're not speaking to the survivor. Are you troubled by that? Uh, right now, I'm incredibly creeped out about it. Um, I, I don't know how I'll feel, say, three years from now. I, I need um, scholars to kind of process what's going on. And, and there's even a, a, a more ex extreme case of virtual reality. Right now, for $5, you can go to the New York Museum of Jewish Heritage 
and for five bucks and an entry ticket to the museum, you can uh, walk with Pincus Gooder through a Maidonic. You can go into the gas chambers, you can go to him uh, to the platform where he said goodbye to his mother and sister. You're w he there with him as he goes through this experience. And it's all virtual reality. It's a virtual reality experience. And to me, that's even creepier. I'm troubled by that. It's, it's, a, it's a movie. It's, it's making fact into well, fiction. Well, what's authentic? Who's speaking in, the, in those cases? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so the lesson that I draw from it is not to police even more vigilantly what counts and what doesn't count, but to, in this age of um, tweets and sound bites, and fake news, to look at everything in its full complexity. You know, to understand what Luntzman is doing, mm -hmm. to understand that there was a first uh, version and that market forces drove the second version of Night, and uh, to uh, be fully, fully aware. Yeah. Henry James um, said that awareness is everything. He was right. And I, I, th I think that's right, that you really need to know and not to uh, simplify things. Well, the other side of it is, if, suppose I'm a denier. I'm a denier. I deny the Holocaust, which okay. is an, an incredible thing for any <laughs> human being to do. But then this is, this is fodder for me. So, oh, here's somebody making it up. So how much can I believe? Who and, cares I, and I can use this to undermine the whole notion. <laughs> But I don't care what you believe. I mean, you're you're so if you're if you're a Holocaust denier, you, you just have such an absurd. You're a non-person. No, you're not a non-person. I would never say that. But your position is just untenable. It's absurd on the face of it. Yeah, yeah. It's as if you said the Earth were, was flat. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. If I were a geologist, I would not be talking to flat earthers. Yeah. Why should I talk to you if you're a Holocaust denier? So it's one, not one, relevant to one me. footnote before we move on to what you're going to talk about this morning, okay. coming really soon, um, is is the notion of uh, the voice. You 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 discussed that a minute ago. The voice. So if I read the book, the, the account, if you will, I'm listening for a voice, an authentic voice, mm -hmm. um, and that goes to all of literature, all of recounting, really, mm -hmm. to find an authentic voice. And right. the voice usually you're looking for. These days, anyway, is English, I think. Um, so, or it could be any language. So, as as a professor of English, uh -huh. you know about English and voices, mm -hmm. and you you're going to be sensitive to when a voice is authentic, whether it's in this book or that book, mm -hmm. whether it's in the Seven book on the stand here <laughs> or in any other book. You're looking for the. Isn't that isn't that true? Tell me. Yes, you're looking for a compelling, uh, convincing voice, a voice that moves you in some way, um, that uh, has something to tell you, something to give, that evokes, resonates. Um, but that's a different issue than no. It goes to all of literature. Yeah, and I just it does. I wanted to just throw that yeah. in. And so, I, I say in my preface um, straight out that I made some things up, but nevertheless, my book is true. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Let's talk about your book for a minute. The sure. Seven. And it's all about your family. Mm -hmm. It's a it it's a family um, a family Holocaust story. Yes. Uh, what happened to you and your family? That okay. is is the, the the driver of this book. Um. So, when you when you say that um, you're writing a Holocaust memoir, the image that um, is usually evoked is a barbed wire concentration camps, death camps. But uh, what's much less known is my story of survival. 10% of uh, Polish Jews survived World War II. Those 10%, most of them survived in the Soviet Union. In a way, Stalin saved Jews from Hitler. Incredible <laughs> to say that, but um, in a way that's true. And I've heard stories of uh, remnants of, um, of 
Jews who were saved in the Soviet Union having portraits of Stalin in their living rooms out of gratitude. So uh, my parents and um, uh, my father and his uh, two brothers, my mother um, and her brother, uh, my father's sister and various others, seven of them, left to Warsaw where they were born and where their parents were and went to an uncle's house in Breslitovsk, which was over the border of the Hitler-Stalin line in the, in the so then in the Soviet Union. Um, there came a point in the war, escaping the Nazis, things had already begun to happen. Um, there were actions against Jews, and uh, one of my uncles was in the Polish army, uh, saw the um, awful might of the German army and said, we've got to get out of here. So he initiated the process of some family members going to um, this uncle's house who had a house in Breslatov, which was now in the Soviet Union. So they went there and at one point Stalin got worried about all these Poles right at the border of Poland. Uh, and he wanted, um, he wanted them to either to become Soviet citizens or to go back to Poland, or he would banish them to some remote prison settlement or gulag, depending, uh, depending on how political you were. And um, at first, uh, uh, these seven just hid. They hid in the attic. And there's this very dramatic story about my great uncle, whose house they were in. He had a wooden leg, which he had acquired in World War I. So when um, uh, the uh, Soviet police came knocking, and these were people from his hometown, he showed them his wooden leg. You know, they came asking uh, for, for um, all, all these relatives, named them by name. Uh, they were up in the attic hiding because they had seen the progress of the, of the police going from house to house. Uh, he showed well, them his leg. Like German people looking. German police. No, no, these this were is this Russian is so, people. Russian, uh, right? This, uh, it sounds like things that happened in Germany, no? Well, looking they were for the looking. Jews hiding in no, the attic. they weren't. They weren't looking to imprison them. They were looking for them to declare what they were going to do. Would they become Soviet citizens? Um, uh, did they want to go mm. back to Poland, or did they want to be banished? Mm. So that was their choice. They couldn't stay put. Um, and so he showed them his wooden leg. He said, I was a soldier in World War I. Uh, don't tell me I'm lying. Uh, you know, I, uh, you have to believe me. I fought for this country. And so they said, well, we know you're lying, but we're going to leave anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible defense. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but then when they gathered themselves and thought about it, uh, they figured, they have to do something, you know, they can't stay in the attic forever. And, um, and so they, uh, they allowed themselves to be banished. And that's how they wound up in Comey SSR, where, uh, I mean, these were city folks, you know, they, uh, uh, my... Um, what city were they from? Warsaw, Poland. The Big biggest ci city, for sure. Big city, uh, very, you know, very urban people. And they found themselves um, in this uh, hinterland with mosquitoes the size of golf balls, uh, with trees everywhere, you know, just uh, so that you couldn't even see the sky. Bears. <laughs> uh, it's a big and they country. Were, it's a huge country. And, um, and uh, they were young. And so uh, they made the best of it. And they, they, and they survived, uh, but they, they went to many places. That, that was only the first. And in each place, in order to, because they were, weren't given enough food, and it wasn't that the Russians were starving Jews. They weren't. Everybody was starving. And as the war progressed, everyone was starving more to a greater degree. <laughs> uh, they had to learn how to adapt, how to negotiate their situation, so that they could survive, which they, they did. Mm -hmm. And it well. meant learning a new language. So it's so interesting to me. And Many I, you new know, languages. It, it burned a hole in my head when you told <laughs> me about the 10% last time. Yeah. What, what that means is that 90% of the 90%, Jews that were in Poland right. died. 
that 0% of the Jews that were in Poland went west into Germany because there was no future for them there. Right. And 10%, the remaining 10%, went east into Russia. About 10%. I About mean, 10%. 10 percent survived. Most of them survived yeah, in the yeah, Soviet it's Union. fantastic. Uh, one, one of my aunts by marriage uh, was a hidden child in Germany, actually, and her sisters also um, survived in Germany. There weren't many. There weren't many, but yeah. yeah. So, the, okay, the other thing is you. Where, where were you born in all of this? I was born in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, near Frunze, a small town called, it's now called, um, actually Frunze is now called Biskek, I think. No, Fr uh, yes, Biskek. Kyrgyzstan. And I was in, a, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I was born in a tiny village called uh, Kant. And um, uh, my parents always talked about the mud roofs, you know, and how when uh, the rains came, the whole roof would collapse and the house practically disappear. So uh, these were, you know, these were not the conditions that urban, uh, urban dwellers who lived in a, you know, high-rise buildings were used to. <laughs> no, I'm sure not. So how did you make your way? Can you give us a precis of how you made your way from Turkestan? It Kyrgyzstan. sounds like Sasha Baron Cohen in his first movie, <laughs> if you remember that. <laughs> I never, <laughs> not, my, not my brand of humor. <laughs> no, I understand. So you made your way from Turkestan all the way to New Jersey and to teaching and being mm -hmm. the director of the Holocaust and Genocide Department. How did you do that? Um, well, my, uh, my parents, uh, my relatives traveled halfway around the world until they got to New Jersey. So it was a long, painful, arduous trip. And um, we got to the West illegally. I was an infant, and, uh, uh, and they um, had to bribe guards on both sides of the border in order to cross. And we were in some kind of covered truck or vehicle, and I couldn't make a sound because we, we weren't supposed to be discovered. And, um, uh, and I, of course, began to cry this, at, <laughs> at the critical moment, oh, no. at which point my mother, um, this is her solution to everything, just stuffed a cookie in my mouth, and that was that. <laughs> that solves every problem. <laughs> uh, food solves every problem. It did for my mother, who was a great, great Jewish cook. So, Ellen, there's just so much more to your life, and I, I hope we can do this again. But um, So right now, you're heading back to UH Manoa. I am. You're giving a talk there today. Yes, can today. you tell us, give you a, a precis yeah. about what you're going to say? Yes, um, I'm giving a talk in, at the Biography Center, uh, where I've been before a couple of times. Um, the first time I was there, the book was just a glimmer in my eye. <laughs> and uh, I remember telling, uh, telling some of the stories that I had from uh, my, my interviews. And uh, one woman from the Jewish community in um, Honolulu said, and I was t talking about all the um, hurdles in the way of my writing the story. She said, ah, just write it already. And that really stayed with me. I said, yes, I should just write it already. So that sort of uh, gave me my jump start. And then I came back uh, to read from a draft. And now I can read from the book itself. <laughs> so I'm going, to read, uh, I'm going to read a chapter called Joseph. It's about this uncle who was in the, um, in, in the Polish army. And he's, he's in the book here. The yes, seventh. he's in the book. He's the uh, second, or second chapter, I think. So one, one question I, I'd really like to okay. know your thoughts about this. Yeah. You've lived in at least two worlds, <laughs> and you have you have mm, found yourself in a position where you, you can comment and teach mm -hmm. and write about a world that I wouldn't say it's long gone, but it's gone a long time anyway. Um, a world, a, a world that world in Europe um, that is so painful for so mm -hmm. many people and mm -hmm. and still with us in so many ways, mm -hmm. um, and it's really a fantastic story. You're different than most mortal beings <laughs> right now. So, uh, you know, you, you must have some philosophical core <laughs> by which you see the world. I, I can tell you what that core is. And I would is. like to know what it is. Yes, confusion. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I know you wanted, uh, you wanted a pearl of wisdom. No, I, actually not confusion. There's one thing I'm not con confused about, and that is that the world is a very complicated place. Um, and you have to allow that complexity. You have to try and see that complexity. And my uh, sort of second life lesson is, uh, concerns the rule of law. One of the reasons that um, the Jews suffered were so vulnerable in Europe is because they lost their citizenship. They were citizens of no country. Um, Hitler deprived them of the, he took away their citizenship. They had no protections. And that's what made them vulnerable. Uh, that if they had been citizens and they could call on the protection of their country, who knows? And, um, and so uh, the rule of law. And I think people should think about immigrants vis-a-vis -vis what happened in the Holocaust and um, be generous. Thank you for that. <laughs> Ellen Friedman, thank you so much. You're for very welcome. Down.